Section 18, Book the 18th of the Iliad of Homer. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Stephen Carney. The Iliad of Homer, by Homer, translated by Theodore Alois Buckley. Section 18, Book the 18th. Argument. Thetis comforts her son for the death of Patroclus, and promises to procure him new armor from Vulcan. At the command of Juno, Achilles comes forth and strikes terror into the enemy. The body of Patroclus is rescued and prepared for funeral rites, and Vulcan forges a suite of armor and a splendid shield for Achilles. Thus they then were fighting, like a blazing fire. But swift-footed Antilochus came as a messenger to Achilles. Him he found in front of his lofty proud ships, revolving in his mind those things which had already been accomplished, and then groaning, he communed with his own mind ah me why are the long-haired achaeans driven back in confusion to the ships routed through the plain i fear lest the gods have accomplished evil sorrows to my soul as my mother once informed me and told me that the bravest of the myrmidons i being yet alive would leave the light of the sun by the hands of the trojans too surely now the valiant son of menoetius is dead obstinate one certainly i desired him having repelled the hostile fire to return to the ships nor to fight bravely with hector whilst he was revolving these things in his mind and in his soul in the meantime the son of illustrious nestor drew near shedding warm tears and delivered his sad message alas o son of warlike peleus surely thou wilt hear a very grievous message which would that it had not taken place patroclus lies low and around his unarmed course they are now fighting whilst crest-tossing hector possesses his armour thus he spoke but him a black cloud of grief overshadowed and taking the burnt ashes with both hands he poured them on his head and denied his comely countenance but the dark ashes everywhere adhered to his rich tunic but he mighty lay extended at great length in the dust and tearing he disordered his hair with his hands the handmaids whom achilles and patroclus had taken grieved in their souls shrieked aloud and ran out of the door round warlike achilles and all smote their breasts with their hands and the limbs of each were relaxed Antilochus on the other side lamented, shedding tears, holding the hands of Achilles, and he kept groaning within his generous heart, for he feared lest he should cut his throat with his sword. Then he moaned dreadfully, and his venerable mother heard him, sitting in the depths of the sea beside her aged father, and immediately lamented. And all the goddesses assembled around her, as many nereids as were at the bottom of the sea. There were Glauci, Thalia, and Simodice, Nisaea, Spio, Thoa, and large-eyed Halia, Simothoi, Acteia, and Lemnoria, Melita, Aeria, and Pithoi, and Agave, Doto, Proto, Ferusa, and Dynameni, Dexameni, Amphonomi, and Calianira, Doris, Panopi, and distinguished Galatea, Nemertes, Apsuades, and Calianasa. There were also Clymene, Ianira, and Ianasa, Maera, Orithia, and fair haired Amathia and other nereids which were in the depths of the sea but the resplendent cave was full of them and all at once they beat their breasts but thetis began the lamentation hear sister nereids that hearing ye may all well know what grieves are in my mind woe is me wretched woe is me who have in an evil hour brought forth the bravest of men i who after having borne a son blameless and valiant the chief of heroes and he grew up like a young tree having reared him like a sapling in a fruitful spot of a field i afterwards sent him forth in the curved ships to ilium to fight against the trojans but i shall not receive him again having returned home to the palace of peleus but whilst he lives and beholds the light of the sun he grieves nor can i going to him avail him aught yet will i go that i may see my beloved son and hear what grief comes upon him remaining away from the battle thus having spoken she left the cave but they all went along with her weeping and the wave of the ocean was cleft around for them but when they reached fertile troy they in order ascended the shore where the fleet ships of the myrmidons were drawn up round swift achilles then his venerable mother shrilly wailing stood near to him deeply lamenting and took the head of her son and mourning addressed to him winged words o son why weepest thou and what sorrow has come upon thy mind 
speak out nor conceal it those things indeed are fulfilled for thee from jove as thou didst formerly pray lifting up thy hands that all the sons of the greeks wanting thee should be collected at the ships and suffer disgraceful deeds but her swift-footed achilles addressed deeply groaning mother mine these things indeed the olympian king hath accomplished for me but what pleasure is there in them to me since patroclus my dear companion is dead whom i honoured beyond all my companions equally with my own head him have i lost and hector having slain him has stripped off his mighty armour a wonder to be seen beautiful which the other gods gave to peleus splendid gifts on that day when they laid thee in the bed of a mortal man would that thou hadst dwelt there among the immortal marine inhabitants and that peleus had wedded a mortal spouse but now thou hast been wedded to the end that immeasurable grief may be upon thy mind for thy son slain whom thou shalt not again receive having returned home since even my mind urges me not to live nor have intercourse with men unless hector first lose his life smitten by my spear and pay the penalty for the slaughter of patroclus the son of menoetius but him thetis in turn addressed pouring forth tears short-lived thou wilt be o my son as thou sayest for fate is ready for thee immediately after hector then heavily sighing swift-footed achilles addressed her may i die then immediately since it was not destined that i should aid my companion now slain but he indeed hath perished far away from his native land and longed for me to be an averter of his doom but now since i shall not return to my dear fatherland nor have been a preservation to patroclus or to my other companions who have been subdued in great numbers by noble hector but sit beside the ships an useless weight on the earth being such as is none of the brazen male achaeans in war though in council there are others superior would that therefore contention might be extinguished from gods and men and anger which is wont to impel even the very wisest to be harsh and which much sweeter than distilling honey like smoke rises in the breasts of men so now did agamemnon king of men enrage me but although greatly grieved let us leave these things to pass by as done subduing from necessity our own spirit within our bosoms but now will i go that i may find hector the destroyer of my friend and i will accept death whensoever jove and the other immortal gods shall please to accomplish it for not even the might of hercules escaped death who was very dear to king jove the son of saturn but fate subdued him and the grievous wrath of juno so also shall i lie when i am dead if a similar fate be destined for me but now may i bear away illustrious glory and compel some one of the trojan women and deep-robed dardanians to sigh frequently wiping away the tears from her tender cheeks with both hands and may they know that i have long ceased from battle wherefore do not hinder me from the combat although loving me for thou wilt not persuade me him then the silver-footed goddess thetis answered certainly this is true o son nor is it an evil thing to avert utter destruction from our friends when afflicted but thy beautiful arms brazen and shining are detained among the trojans which crest tossing hector himself having on his shoulders boasts of yet i suspect that he will not long glory in them for death is near to him but do thou by no means enter the slaughter of mars before thou beholdest me with thine eyes coming hither for at dawn i will return with the rising sun bearing beautiful armour from king vulcan thus having spoken she turned round from her son and being turned addressed her marine sisters enter ye now the broad bosom of the deep about to behold the marine old man and the mansions of my sire and tell him all things but i go to lofty olympus to vulcan the skilful artist to try if he is willing to give my son illustrious glittering armour thus she spoke but they immediately sank beneath the wave of the sea but thetis the silver-footed goddess again departed to olympus that she might bear the illustrious armour to her beloved son her on the one hand her feet bore towards olympus but the greeks flying with the heaven sent uproar from manslaughtering hector reached the ships and the hellespont nor had the well-grieved greeks drawn off the dead body of patroclus the attendant of achilles out of the reach of weapons for now again both infantry and cavalry pursued him and hector the son of priam like unto a flame in violence thrice did illustrious hector seize him behind the feet eager to draw him away and loudly shouted to the trojans and thrice did the two ajaces clad in impetuous might forcibly repulse him from the course whilst he with steady purpose ever relying on his might sometimes charged through the crowd and sometimes again stopped loudly shouting but never retreated altogether 
but as night-watching shepherds are by no means able to drive away from a carcass a tawny lion greatly hungering so were the two warriors the ajaces unable to drive away hector the son of priam from the body and now indeed would he have dragged it off and obtained great glory had not fleet wind-footed iris come as a messenger to the son of peleus running down from olympus that he should arm himself unknown to jove and the other gods for juno sent her forth and standing near she addressed to him winged words arise son of peleus most terrible of all men defend patroclus for whom a dire contest is maintained before the ships but they are slaughtering each other the one party fighting for the slain corpse while the other the trojans rush on that they may drag him away to wind-swept ilium and above all illustrious hector desire to seize him for his mind prompts him to fix his head upon stakes having cut it from the tender neck but up nor lie longer but let reverence touch thy soul that patroclus should be a source of delight to trojan dogs a disgrace would be to thee if the dead body should come at all defiled but her noble swift-footed achilles then answered which of the gods o goddess iris sent thee as a messenger to me but him fleet wind-footed iris again addressed juno sent me forth the glorious spouse of jove nor does the lofty throned son of saturn know it nor any of the immortals who inhabit snowy olympus but her swift-footed achilles answering addressed and how can i go to the slaughter for they possess my armour besides my dear mother does not permit me to be armed before that with my eyes i behold her coming for she hath promised that she will bear me beautiful armour from vulcan but i indeed not know of another whose splendid armour i could put on except the shield of ajax son of telamon but he i hope mingles in the front ranks slaying with his spear round the head of patroclus but him swift-footed iris again addressed well too do we know that they possess thy distinguished armour yet even thus going towards the ditch show thyself to the trojans if perchance the trojans terrified may desist from battle and the warlike harassed sons of the greeks may breathe again and there be a short respite from fighting thus indeed having spoken swift-footed iris departed but achilles dear to jove arose and around his strong shoulders minerva threw her fringed aegis and the divine one of goddesses crowned his head around with a golden cloud and from it she kindled a shining flame and as when smoke ascending from a city reaches the ether from an island afar off which foes invest who pouring out from their city contend all day in hateful fight but with the setting sun torches blaze one after another and the splendour arises rushing upwards for their neighbours to behold if perchance they may come with ships as repellers of the war thus did the flame from the head of achilles reach the sky he stood having advanced from the wall to the trench nor mingled with the greeks for he reverenced the prudent advice of his mother there standing he shouted and pallas minerva on the other side vociferated and stirred up immense tumult among the trojans and as the tone is very clear when a trumpet sounds while deadly foes are investing a city so distinct then was the voice of the descendant of achis but when they heard the brazen voice of achilles the soul was disturbed to all whilst the beautiful maned steeds turned the chariots backwards for their pressured sorrows in their mind the charioteers were panic-struck when they beheld the terrific indefatigable flame blazing over the head of magnanimous pelides for the azured-eyed goddess minerva lighted it thrice over the trench loudly shouted noble achilles and thrice were the trojans and their illustrious allies thrown into confusion there then perished twelve bravest heroes by their chariots and spears whilst the greeks dragging patroclus with joy out of the reach of weapons stretched him on a bier but his beloved companion stood round him mourning and with them followed swift-footed achilles shedding warm tears when he beheld his faithful comrade lying upon a bier lacerated with the sharp brass whom indeed he has sent forth with his horses and chariots to battle but he did not receive him again having returned but the large-eyed venerable juno sent the unwearied sun to return to the flowing of the ocean against his inclination the sun then set and noble greeks desisted from the violent conflict and the equally destructive battle the trojans again on the other side retiring from the violent combat loosed their fleet steeds from their chariots but they assembled in the council before they bethought them of their banquet the assembly consisted of persons standing up nor did any one dare to sit or fear possessed all because achilles had appeared who had long abstained from the direful combat among them prudent polydamus the son of panthus began to speak for he alone saw both the future and the past he was a companion of hector and they were born in one night but the one excelled in counsel and the other greatly in the spear he wisely counselling harangued them and spoke 
my friends consider well on both sides for i advise that we now return to the city nor await the sacred morn in the plain near the ships for we are far away from the wall as long indeed as this man was wroth with noble agamemnon so long were the greeks more easy to fight with for even i was delighted passing the night by with the swift barks expecting that we should take the equally plied barks but now greatly do i fear swift-footed pelides so violent is his soul nor will he be content to remain in the plain where usually the trojans and greeks in the intervening space divide the force of war but he will combat for the city and our wives we will go then towards the city be persuaded by me for so it must be ambrosial night at present hath made swift-footed pelides cease but if rushing forth to-morrow with his arms he shall find us here then will some one know him for gladly will he reach sacred ilium whosoever shall escape but dogs and vultures will devour many of the trojans oh that such tidings may be far from our ears but if we be obedient to my words although sad we shall have protection in the assembly during the night and the towers and lofty gates and the valves fitted to them long well polished fashioned together will protect the city but to-morrow at early dawn we will stand on the towers arrayed in armour and it would be difficult for him even if he should wish it coming from the ships to fight with us around the wall back again will he go to the ships after he has satiated his high-necked steed with a varied course driving beneath the city but his mind will not permit him to rush within nor will he ever lay it waste sooner shall the fleet dogs devour him him then crest-tossing hector sternly regarding addressed no longer o polydamus dost thou speak these things agreeable to me thou who advisest us returning to be cooped up in the city are ye not yet satiated with being shut up within the towers formerly indeed all articulately speaking men pronounce the city of priam rich in gold and in brass but now have the rich treasures of our houses perished and many possessions have already departed to phrygia and agreeable moeonia to be sold since mighty jove was enraged but at this crisis when the son of politic saturn has granted me to obtain glory at the ships and to hem in the greeks by the sea no longer foolish man disclose these counsels to the people for none of the trojans will obey nor will i permit them but come let us all obey as i shall advise at present take supper into your ranks throughout the army be mindful of the watch and keep guard each of you but whosoever of the trojans is particularly anxious about his possessions collecting them together let him give to the people to be publicly consumed it is better that any of them should enjoy them than the greeks but to-morrow with the dawn arrayed in armour let us excite sharp conflict at the hollow ships and if truly noble achilles has arisen at the ships it will be the worse for him if he wishes to fight i indeed will not fly him from the horrid sounding battle but will stand very obstinately against him whether he bear away great glory or i bear it away mars is common and even slays the slayer thus hector harangued and the trojans shouted in applause foolish men for pallas minerva had taken away their senses from them for they assented to hector advising destructive things whilst no one assented to polydamus who advised prudent counsel then they took supper through the army but the greeks lamenting all night wept over patroclus but among them pelides led a ceaseless lamentation placing his manslaying hands upon the breast of his companion very frequently sighing as the well-bearded lion from whom the stag hunter has stolen the cubs out of the thick forest and he is grieved coming afterwards and through many valleys he goes tracking the footsteps of the man if anywhere he may find him for very keen rage possesses him so deeply sighing he addressed the myrmidons alas vain indeed was the promise i uttered on that day encouraging the hero menoetius in our halls for i said that i would bring back his illustrious son to opus having wasted troy and obtained a share of the spoil but if jove fulfils not for men all their intentions for it is fated that we shall both stain with blood the same earth here in troy but neither shall aged horse-driving peleus receive me in his palaces returning nor my mother thetis but the earth shall here hold me now however o patroclus since after thee i go beneath the earth i shall not perform thy funeral rites before that i bring hither the arms and head of magnanimous hector thy murderer and behead twelve illustrious sons of the trojans before thy pile enraged on account of thee slain 
meanwhile thou shalt lie thus at the crooked ships and round thee trojan dames and deep-bosomed dardanians shall weep and shed tears night and day whom we ourselves have toiled to get by our valour and the long spear laying waste the rich cities of articulate speaking men thus having spoken noble achilles ordered his companions to surround a large tripod with fire that as soon as possible they might wash away the bloody gore from patroclus they then placed a bathing tripod on the blazing fire and poured water into it and taking faggots lighted them under it the fire indeed encircled the belly of the tripod and the water was warmed but when the water boiled in the sonorous brass then they both washed him and anointed him with rich oil and they filled up his wounds with ointment nine years old and laying him upon a bed they covered him with fine linen from head to foot and over all with a white mantle all night then the myrmidons lamenting patroclus wept around swift-footed achilles but jove addressed juno his sister and wife and at length thou hast accomplished thy object o large-eyed venerable juno having aroused swift-fooled achilles surely the waving crested greeks are born from thy very self but him large-eyed venerable juno then answered most imperious son of saturn what a word hast thou spoken surely now any man who is mortal and knows not so many designs might accomplish this against a man how therefore ought not i who boast myself to be the chief of the goddesses both from birth and also because i am called thy wife and thou rulest over all the immortals being enraged with the trojans to be able to design evils against them thus they indeed conversed with one another but silver-footed thetis reached the abode of vulcan incorruptible starry remarkable amongst the immortals brazen which the lame-footed himself had constructed him she found sweating exerting himself at the bellows earnestly working for he was making full twenty tripods to sand around the wall of his well-built palace under the base of each he placed golden wheels that of their own accord they might enter the heavenly council and again return home a wonder to be seen so much finished had they but he had not yet added the well-made handles which he was preparing and he was forging the rivets whilst he was toiling at these things with skilful mind meanwhile thetis the silver-footed goddess came to him but the beautiful and fair-veiled cheris whom illustrious vulcan had espoused advancing beheld her and hung upon her hand and addressed her and spoke why o long-robed thetis venerable beloved dost thou visit our abode formerly thou wast not in the habit of coming frequently but follow farther onwards that i may set before thee hospitable fare thus having spoken the divine goddesses led on then indeed she placed her upon a silver-studded throne beautiful variously wrought and there was a stool under her feet but she called vulcan the distinguished artist and spoke this word come hither vulcan thetis now has need of thee but her illustrious vulcan then answered assuredly then an awful and revered goddess is within who saved me when distress came upon me fallen down far by the contrivance of my shameless mother who wished to conceal me being lame then should i have suffered sorrows in my mind had not eurynome and thetis received me in their bosoms eurynome daughter of the refluent ocean with them for nine years wrought i in brass many ingenious works of art buckles twisted bracelets and clasped tubes in the hollow cave whilst round us flowed the immense stream of ocean murmuring with foam nor did any other either of gods or mortal men know it but thetis and eurynome who preserved me knew it she now comes to my house wherefore there is need that i should repay all the rewards of my safety to fair-haired thetis but set now before her good hospitable fare whilst i lay aside my bellows and all my tools he spoke and rose a wondrous bulk from his anvil block limping and his weak legs moved actively beneath him the bellows he laid apart from the fire and all the tools with which he laboured he collected into a silver chest with a sponge he wiped all over his face and both his hands his strong neck and shaggy breast then put on his tunic and seized his stout sceptre but he went out of the doors limping and golden handmaids like unto living maidens moved briskly about the king and in their bosoms was prudence with understanding and within them was voice and strength and they are instructed in works by the immortal gods these were busily occupied by the king's side but he hobbling along sat down upon a splendid throne near where thetis was and hung upon her hand and spoke and addressed her why long-robed thetis venerable and dear hast thou come to our abode 
for indeed thou didst not often come before make known what thou desirest for my mind orders me to perform it if in truth i can perform it and if it is to be performed him then thetis pouring forth tears answered o vulcan has any then as many as are the goddesses in olympus endured so many bitter griefs in her mind as to me above all jove the son of saturn has given sorrows me from among the other marine inhabitants has he subjected to a man to peleus son of Achis, and i have endured the couch of a man very much against my will he indeed now lies in his palaces afflicted with grievous old age but now other woes are my lot after he had granted me to bring forth and nurture a son distinguished among heroes and who grew up like a plant him having reared as a plant in a fertile spot of the field i sent forth in the crooked barks to ilium to fight with the trojans but him i shall not receive again having returned home to the mansion of peleus as long however as he lives to me and beholds the light of the sun he suffers sorrow nor am i going to him able to avail him aught the maid whom the sons of the greeks selected as a reward for him her hath king agamemnon taken back again from his hands certainly grieving for her he has been wasting his soul whilst the trojans were hemming in the greeks at the ships nor suffered them to go beyond the gates but the elders of the greeks supplicated him and named many distinguished presents but then he refused to avert destruction yet he clad patroclus in his own armour and sent him forth to the battle and he gave with him much people all day they fought round the scaean gates and certainly on that day had overturned troy had not apollo slain among the foremost warriors the gallant son of menoetius after having done much mischief and given glory to hector on this account do i now approach thy knees if thou wilt give to my short-lived son a shield and helmet and beautiful greaves joined with clasps and a corslet for what were his his faithful companion has lost subdued by the trojans and achilles lies upon the ground grieving in his soul her then illustrious vulcan answered take courage nor let these things be cause of uneasiness in thy mind for would that i could so surely conceal him from dread sounding death when grievous fate approaches him as that beautiful armour shall be ready for him such as any one of many men shall hereafter admire whosoever may behold it so saying he left her there and went towards the bellows which he turned towards the fire and commanded them to work and full twenty bellows blew in the furnaces exciting a varied well-regulated blast to be ready for him at one time busy at another the reverse as vulcan pleased and that the work might be complete he cast into the fire impenetrable brass and tin precious gold and silver but next he placed a mighty anvil on the stock and took in one hand his strong hammer and with the other grasped the forceps first of all he formed a shield both large and solid decorating it all over and around it he threw a shining border triple and glittering and from it there hung a silver belt of the shield itself there were five folds but on it he formed many curious works with cunning skill on it he wrought the earth and the heaven and the sea the unwearied sun and the full moon on it also he represented all the constellations with which the heaven is crowned the pleiades the hyades and the strength of orion and the bear which they also called the appellation of the wane which there revolves and watches orion but it alone is free from the baths of the ocean in it likewise he wrought two fair cities of articulate speaking men in the one indeed there were marriages and feasts and they were conducting the brides from their chambers through the city with brilliant torches and many a bridal song was raised the youthful dancers were wheeling round and amongst them pipes and lyres uttered a sound and the women standing each at her portals admired and people were crowded together in an assembly and there a contest had arisen for two men contended for the ransom money of a slain man the one affirmed that he had paid all appealing to the people but the other denied averring that he had received not and both wished to find an end of the dispute before a judge the people were applauding both supporters of either party and the heralds were keeping back the people but the elders sat upon polished stones in a sacred circle and the pleaders held in their hands the staves of the clear-voiced heralds with these then they arose and alternately pleaded their cause moreover in the midst lay two talents of gold to give to him who should best establish his claim among them but round the other city sat two armies of people glittering in arms and one of two plans was agreeable to them either to waste it or to divide all things into two parts the wealth whatever the pleasant city contained within it 
they however had not yet complied but were secretly arming themselves for an ambuscade meanwhile their beloved wives and young children kept watch standing above and amongst them the men whom old age possessed but the younger men advanced but mars was their leader and pallas minerva both golden and clad in golden dresses beautiful and large along with their armour radiant all around and indeed like gods but the people were of humbler size but when they now had reached a place where it appeared fit to lay an ambuscade by a river where there was a watering place for all sorts of cattle there then they settled clad in shining steel there apart from the people sat two spies watching when they might perceive the sheep and crooked horned oxen these however soon advanced and two shepherds accompanied them amusing themselves with their pipes for they had not yet perceived the stratagem then they discerning them ran in upon them and immediately slaughtered on all sides the herds of oxen and the beautiful flocks of snow-white sheep and slew the shepherds besides but they when they heard the great tumult amongst the oxen previously sitting in front of the assembly mounting their nimble-footed steeds pursued and soon came up with them then having marshalled themselves they fought a battle on the banks of the river and wounded one another with their brazen spears amongst them mingled discord and tumult and destructive fate holding one alive recently wounded another unwounded but a third slain she drew by the feet through the battle and had the garment around her shoulders crimsoned with the gore of men but they turned about like living mortals and fought and drew away the slaughtered bodies of each other on it he also placed a soft fallow field rich glebe wide thrice ploughed and in it many ploughmen drove hither and thither turning round their teams but when returning they reached the end of the field then a man advancing gave into their hands a cup of very sweet wine but they turned themselves in series eager to reach the other end of the deep fallow but it was all black behind similar to ploughed land which indeed was a marvel beyond all others on it likewise he placed a field of deep corn where reapers were cutting having sharp sickles in their hands some handfuls fell one after the other upon the ground along the furrow and the binders of sheaves tied others with bands three binders followed the reapers whilst behind them boys gathering the handfuls and bearing them in their arms continually supplied them and amongst them the master stood by the swathed in silence holding a sceptre delighted in heart but apart beneath an oak servants were preparing a banquet and sacrificing a huge ox they ministered whilst women sprinkled much white barley on the meat as a supper for the reapers on it likewise he placed a vineyard heavily laden with grapes beautiful golden but the clusters throughout were black and it was supported throughout by silver poles round it he drew an azure trench and about it a hedge of tin but there was only one path to it by which the gatherers went when they collected the vintage young virgins and youths of tender minds bore the luscious fruit in woven baskets in the midst of whom a boy played sweetly on a shrill harp and with tender voice sang gracefully to the chord whilst they beating the ground in unison with dancing and shouts followed skipping with their feet in it he also wrought a herd of oxen with horns erect but the kine were made of gold and of tin and rushed out with a lowing from the stall to the pasture beside a murmuring stream along the breeze waving reeds four golden herdsmen accompanied the oxen and nine dogs swift of foot followed but two terrible lions detained the bull roaring among the foremost oxen and he was dragged away loudly bellowing and the dogs and youths followed for a rescue they indeed having torn off the skin of the great ox lapped up his entrails and black blood and the shepherds vainly pressed upon them urging on their fleet dogs these however refused to bite the lions but standing very near barked and shunned them on it illustrious vulcan also formed a pasture in a beautiful grove full of white sheep and folds and covered huts and cottages illustrious vulcan likewise adorned it with a dance like unto that which in wide gnosis daedalus contrived for fair-haired ariadne there danced youths and alluring virgins holding each other's hands at the wrist these wore fine linen robes but those were dressed in well-woven tunics shining as with oil these also had beautiful garlands and those wore golden swords hanging from silver belts sometimes with skilful feet they nimbly bounded round as when a potter sitting shall make trial of a wheel fitted to his hands whether it will run and at other times again they ran back to their places through one another but a great crowd surrounded the pleasing dance amusing themselves and amongst them two tumblers beginning their song spun round through the midst but in it he also formed the vast strength of the river oceanus near the last border of the well-formed shield 
but when he had finished the shield large and solid he next formed for him a corslet brighter than a splendour of fire he also made for him a strong helmet fitted to his temples beautiful and variously ornamented and on it placed a golden crest and made greaves for him of ductile tin but when renowned vulcan had with toil made all the armour lifting it up he laid it before the mother of achilles but she like a hawk darted down from snowy olympus bearing from vulcan the shining armour end of book the eighteenth read by stephen carney